So first of all, I welcome our guest to St. Joseph's. We're happy to have you here. And just a few moments, well, just a few announcements, so that when we do the procession, we're just going to do a smaller version. Normally, we're three times around the church. Someday, we'll actually go outside and go around and come back in the front door, but that's for the future. So to this, this year, we'll just make, just the servers and I will go up the side and then come down the center. They have a couple hymns they'll try to sing during that time. Other than that, your palms will all be blessed at the time when we do all the palms in the back still and of course the ones that are on the table. Um, you're more than welcome obviously to take them also when you go to the house back home. And if those wishing to come up to communion at that time, we just remind you to keep the, the distance as you stand in line, keep your six feet, which of course we've heard 24 hours a day nonstop. So we all know the regulations and the rules. And other than that, we are absolutely delighted to be able to be open to receive this great gift of peace and of the divine mysteries from our Lord who allows us this gift during these weeks, this week of celebration. So we will continue now on page 287. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. O Christ our God, make us worthy on this Hosanna Sunday to go out to meet you at your glorious second coming. Just as the crowds went out to meet you at your first coming, they carried palms and olive branches while shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord to save us and to renew us. To you, to your Father, and to your Holy Spirit, be glory now and forever. Peace be with the church and her children. To the praise, glory, and honor. To the most holy Trinity. We burn this incense, give you a nice song. Let us raise glory, honor, and praise to the only begotten Son, the eternal, holy, and blessed Word, whose holiness is boundless. To the good Master who willingly humbled himself, although he is the power and the wisdom of God, and to the one who is glorified by spiritual powers, and who was pleased with the praises of infants and of the children. To the good one be glory and honor on this feast and all the days of our lives, now and forever. Amen. O Christ our God in the heavens, you are carried on a chariot of light. Yet on earth you ride on a donkey's colt. You are hidden from the spiritual powers, yet you are praised by your holy disciples in the streets of Jerusalem. O Holy One, you are seated on the throne of your glory, yet you are honored by the crowds, the old and the young. Infants and children who spread their cloaks and branches be for you. In your grace you have planned all of this for our salvation. 
Now, O Lord, we implore you with the fragrance of this incense to make us worthy to celebrate this feast with joy and with gladness and with reverence for your profound humility. Prepare us to go out to meet you at your second coming with purity, wearing robes of glory, shouting with those who celebrate. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. In that eternal feast, may we and our departed raise glory to you, to your Father, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Christ, you are the pleasing to the Father who sent you, and you are the pure incense who has made creation fragrant, bringing joy to the world. You fulfilled what was said by the prophets, and you were delighted by the praise of the children. May we rejoice in the sweetness of your love. Make our souls and senses fragrant with the purity of your holiness, so that we may praise and thank you, your Father and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Kaddishat, Aloha, Kaddishat, Listen and accept the truth. 
Zion sings hymns of glory, O Jerusalem, give praise, for your gates have been strengthened, listen and accept the truth. A reading from the first letter of Saint pa- from the letter of Saint Paul to the Philippians. Glory to the Lord of Paul and the apostles. May the mercy of God descend upon the reader, the listeners, and upon this parish and her children forever. Paul and Timothy, slaves of Christ Jesus, to all the holy ones in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, with the overseers and ministers. <clears throat> Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God at every remembrance of you, praying always with joy in my every prayer for all of you because of your partnership for the gospel from the first day until now. I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work in you will continue to complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right that I should think this way about all of you, because I hold you in my heart, you who are all partners with me in grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I long for all of you, how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may increase ever more and more, in knowledge and every kind of perception, to discern what is of value, so that you may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ for the glory and praise of God. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that my situation has turned out rather to advance the gospel so that my imprisonment has become well known in Christ throughout the whole praetorium. Praise be to God always. From the mouths of infants and children, you have fashioned praise. to the praise, glory, and honor of the Most Holy Trinity. We burn this incense. Kyrie eleison. Before the proclamation of the gospel of our Savior announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. Peace be with you. And with your spirit. From the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. John, who proclaimed life to the world. Let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls. The Apostle John writes, On the next day, when the great crowd had come to the feast, had heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, They took palm branches and they went out to greet him, and they cried out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. 
And Jesus found an ass, and he sat upon it, as it is written, Fear no more, O daughter Zion. See, your king comes seated upon an ass's colt. His disciples did not understand this at first, but when Jesus had been glorified, they did remember that these things had been written about him and that they had done this for him. So the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from death continued to testify. This was also why the crowd went out to meet him, because they had heard that he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, You see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the entire world has gone after him. Now there were also some Greeks among those who had come up to worship at the festival. And they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and they asked him, Sir, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went and he told Andrew, and then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. This is the truth, peace be with you. Praise and blessings to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Lord, Fear not, O daughter Zion, behold, your king comes. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, we have enough of a saga and depression and discouragement going on among us, so I want to point out something to you about the Gospels very distinctly. Now, in our Syriac tradition, the Gospel of St. John figures very heavily. In fact, sometimes you'll even see diagrams where you'll see a baldacchino, the scriptures will be enthroned on the center, and there will be four columns coming up and a canopy over the top, and of course, the necessary peacocks for Syria. And in that tradition, you'll have the columns listed, one of them being the Gospel of St. John, Isaiah, Ezekiel. These columns are given names because they will hold up what this glory around the sacred word of God of the scriptures are. And the reason why I bring that up is because, as you see, we have the Gospel of St. John being quoted today for Hosanna Sunday, Shanini, Palm Sunday. And the emphasis of St. John's Gospel is very important. And in fact, I'm, I'm going to encourage you during these days that come that you read the Passion of St. John, that you read the Gospel. It's not very long. But the reason why is because well, the first three Gospels are written more or less the same time within those first decades following our Lord's ascension. The Gospel of St. John is written decades after all three of them. And so St. John, as an old man, when he compiles and puts together his own witness, you have to remember, too, that the word that was used in the beginning, we call them Gospels. Of course, there's no title in the books. They're just books. We call them Gospels, meaning the good tidings in the English. But the original apostolic fathers, when they make reference to these writings of the apostles, they actually call them by a term which we would translate as memoirs. And so these are the recounting of the memories for people who already believe. Remember, the Gospels are written for people who are already baptized and who already believe. These are, test these are further testimonies to people who already believe in the reality that God has come to the face of the earth. Now, I bring that up because it's important to see that those first three Gospels are really, they're not identical, they come from different angles, but we call them synoptics because you can see them in one optic. You can see them in one view. They pretty much tell, even all, in some cases, down to the details, the exact same story. But when St. John comes along and tells the same story, he tells it completely differently. 
He will spend chapters on what is said at the Last Supper and never recounts to us the institution of the Eucharist. There's never a moment when he says, and Jesus took bread, he took wine, said, this is my body, this is my blood. That isn't even in the memoir of St. John. But St. John is giving us what had been said, and in fact, it's even a much longer section, chapter-wise, than the two chapters he gives just to tell the story of the death on Calvary. Because in the Gospel of St. John, what he does, it is all about revelation. And while St. Paul and his epistles and the earlier evangelists recount the redemption coming from our Lord's death being a sacrifice, which it is, St. John is going to recount the story that everything in Jesus' life is a sign and a revelation. It teaches us. And of course, as you well know already, in the Syriac tradition, it's all about veiling and unveiling. It's all about the hidden God who will always remain hidden to us, but that we have some created words, for example, in the scriptures, which will give us some idea in human babbling about the hidden divinity, the origin of all. Which is why even historically, as we've mentioned, our sanctuary would normally have a veil across it in which you'd see the altar only at certain parts of the liturgy. And this is precisely the spirit of St. John. In his gospel, everything that takes place from Palm Sunday through his death, his resurrection, has to do with revealing the hidden father. It's why it's in St. John's gospel during that Last Supper that he recounts that very mysterious phrase when Philip, the same man that the Gentiles, the Greeks, go and see, and probably they go to Philip because his name Philippos, at least it's a Greek name. Somebody called Yuda, somebody called Jacob. They're not, you know, culturally, okay, let's go to the guy called Philip. And that's why they go and they say, sir, please, we'd like to see the rabbi. And then we're told they get together and then they bring these Gentiles. They bring these non-Israelites to see our Lord. And the story continues into our Lord's passion. But that is also why St. John recounts it, because Philip is the one at the Last Supper who asks our Lord by saying to him, is it now that you will show us the Father? You will show us the hidden divinity? And our Lord answers Philip and he says, have I been with you this long of time? And you still don't understand that he who sees me sees the Father. This isn't to say that he is the Father. He will say that also I and the Father are one. But what he's saying is because of what you see in the incarnation, this is the revelation that is given to you of the hidden Father. Which is why in our Syriac tradition, all of the prayers focus upon our Lord directly. There's never any to the Father through the Holy, in the Holy Spirit through the Son. We don't give that hierarchical. All the prayers finish in a Trinitarian formula of the hidden one and the only one who shines his face to us and gives us an ability to grasp what necessarily is ineffable is this incarnation. Which is why St. John will also understand that our Lord's death has that sacrificial aspect to it. But the reason what our Lord, excuse me, what St. John insists upon in the gospel is the very incarnation by the fact that the Messiah or the hidden son enters, the divine word enters historically into time, that is already the beginning of the unveiling. And St. John sees the incarnation as really being the foundation of the restoration and the redemption of the world, not just the death, but the entire thing. So that when St. John comes to this week that we call great, when he comes to this week of the passion, He's going to recount the story and does recount the story in a way to say all of this is unveiling, unveiling the infinite, unlimited, ineffable charity, love, which is the origin of all things that you now see historically in front of you. And so why we mention that is because everything in those first three Gospels that have to do with kind of the tragedy or the pain or the suffering or the humiliation specifically concerning our Lord, being spit upon, being scourged, crowned, all of these things are actually left out of St. John. 
He doesn't talk, I mean, he talks about our Lord's arrest, he talks about his passion. There is one slap. There is a moment when he's being questioned by the high priest, and he answers him, but he doesn't give the answer they want, and one of the guards next to our Lord just belts him across the face and says, is this the way you speak to the high priest? And our Lord simply answers, and he says, why do you slap me? What have I said wrong? And if I've spoken the truth, why do you strike me? That's the only moment of that kind of humiliation. It begins in a garden. So in the bulletin this week, I talk about the garden. The garden keeps coming up because our notion that redemption is the return to paradise, not in the modern sense of paradise, but a return to the origins of what God intended the world to be in its proper order and beauty, which was smashed apart by what we call original sin but which is God's intent that we turn to paradise. And so St. John in chapter 18 just begins the story, and he went to a garden. Doesn't say Gethsemane, doesn't give any other specific, a garden. Now it's Gethsemane, we know this from the other stories that are recounted to us. But St. John is specifically trying to show to us this revelation of God, which is why at the moment of our Lord's death, the soldier will open our Lord's side. And the famous scene of blood and water that comes out of our Lord's sight, that's only in St. John. St. John does not recount the sweating of blood, the agony in Gethsemane. He does not recount in the arrest the kiss of Judas, the humiliation, that betrayal of friendship. He doesn't even recount the flight of all the disciples when they all run away. That's not in St. John either. He doesn't give the drawn out trial before the Sanhedrin with the other ones give. There is a one half verse referring to our Lord before Caiaphas. There is no account, as we said, of these mockeries, of these insults, these injuries. And they don't recount that invocation of Psalm 21, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He doesn't recount that either. And there's no darkness recounted in the Gospel of St. John when our Lord dies. What St. John is pointing out to us is the beginning of the garden, the return to paradise, and the natural majesty of who is this man being arrested. Remember, it's only in St. John that he recounts that episode in which he asks them, who are you looking for? And when they answer Jesus of Nazareth, our Lord says, I am he. It is the name of the revelation of the God of Mount Sinai in the burning bush. It's repeated three times during that arrest. And remember, when he says that to them the first time, I am he, they all fall backward on the ground. Surely shocked and unaware why they drop onto the ground. But St. John wants us to remind us, this is not a human tragedy that happens to have a resurrection at the end of this. This is God who enters into time and embraces death to turn it on its head, and this is the one who is always in charge, is our Lord himself. And so that when St. John does spend more time with the whole Roman trial, with Pilate, but of course, again, in St. John, it'll have that famous exchange. When Pilate's just scratching his head and it's like, why are your people betraying you to me? What have you done wrong? They say you're a king. And all this aspect of king comes in, in St. John's Gospel. Who is the one who reigns? Who is the one of source of order and harmony, in this case for the cosmos? It is this one. And when our Lord gives testimony linking his kingship with truth, that's the infamous, infamous moment when Pilate just simply says, what's truth? You know, you got your opinion, you have your opinion, what's truth? And that begins the moment when our Lord is now going to be directly destined to die. The rejection of the possibility of truth. So St. John wants us to remember these things. He wants us to know that our Lord is in charge from beginning and the end. And during this Roman trial, they have the verses that we do not have in the other Gospels, in which when they bring our Lord out, and he has been scourged, he has been beaten. It's mentioned in the Gospel of St. John, of course, and he presents him to the crowds, this man who's been beaten, and he says the famous lines which we still use in Latin, ecce homo, 
Behold the man. Now in the historical context, he's trying to get this crowd to look at our Lord and say, show a little pity, isn't this enough? But of course, the term, behold the man, this is the new Adam, this is the restoration of what humanity is meant to be. That takes on a totally different meaning in the Gospel of St. John. And of course, at the time just before he's led to his crucifixion, behold your king, this is your king, you take him. So kingship and truth and the restoration of Adam is very important. And then St. John, as I mentioned, his gospel is written to people who already believe, of course. They're already members of the church. He's the one that insists upon that moment when the, the soldiers are, are playing dice because they've stripped our Lord naked. And the robe that he had on, which certainly his mother probably made for him, is seamless, the way it's woven, the way it's been stitched together. It doesn't have seams where you can take pieces and pull things off, pull off the bottom part and that. So they roll dice for it so they can have the whole garment. It's not recounted in the first Gospels. They probably thought it didn't matter. It's just something the soldiers are doing while they wait for this man to die. But for St. John, this is extremely important because the seamless garment for the fathers of the church and in St. John's recounting represents the body of Christ itself, the church, that it is seamless, that it is one, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And so it remains one even during this agony upon the cross, the oneness of the body which is to be created. And of course, it's why only St. John recounts the presence of the beloved disciple, John, and the presence of his mother there, and the whole dialogue, not even a dialogue, it's a monologue with our Lord, to say to his mother, behold your son, and to John, behold your mother. That beloved disciple who never gives his name, represents all of us at the foot of the cross. This is what St. John wants to understand. Our Lord is in control of everything. He is king, he is truth, he is in power. And now he commits this whole care of the oneness of the body which will continue in testimony and legacy after him, on which you are part of that unbroken chain from that moment. And then as we mentioned, that opening of our Lord's side, the revelation of the sacred heart and the blood and water that comes forth. But he doesn't recount, as a last detail, the tearing of the veil in the temple. Every other gospel talks about the moment our Lord died, the veil is torn, and even they give, two of them give from top to bottom, not bottom to top with human hands. It rips from the top and then tears downward in that place of the Holy of Holies, where the hidden God was merely symbolized. It's the piercing of our Lord's side that St. John wants us to understand. That is the rending of the veil, and the hidden God of all power and majesty is open to you through this death, yes, but through this revelation. He is the living veil, and St. Paul will pick it up later on in the letter to the Hebrews. So with that kind of overview, I highly encourage you, especially this year, read the Passion, but read the Passion of St. John. You have five chapters given of what our Lord says and the revelation of love and truth during the Last Supper. Five chapters, it goes on forever. And it is stunningly beautiful, just take a piece Think about it. You could take all five days, six days of this week. Take one chapter today, one chapter tomorrow. Make it up to Thursday, and you have the two chapters left for Friday and Saturday. The great discourse, we call it, or the gospel of light, it's also known as, the discourse of light. And then, of course, chapter 18, follow, chapter 18 and 19. So 13 is the beginning of St. John, all the way up through 17, those five chapters. Then you have chapter 18 and chapter 19 about the actual death, only two chapters, less than half that is spent on the first Last Supper. And then you have chapter 20 and 21 on the resurrection, the capping of the glory. Remember our religion is, is one of glory, of revelation, of peace, and of light that is given to us by the hidden light, unseen even in this moment, 
which is why the divine mysteries are so important, because they are personal revelations. And while we may be able to watch this later on on the internet, which is good, that's only a photo. It's a picture. It's still something very good. But the divine mysteries are an event. And that revelation allows us to personally access it. And that's why, yes, the doors, as we've mentioned to you, we will keep, try to control any kind of crowds that may come. But we are very happy and humbled before God that the sacred heart of revelation of the hidden Father has allowed us to give testimony and witness even during this chaos. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Please stand. You can use the booklets if you've taken them from the back for the blessing of palms and the procession which will take place now. But of more than the Holy Land, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Son of God, stretch forth your right hand and bless these branches here. Prepare for your people and for the sake of your holy name. We call up. Thank you. 
O Christ our God, yesterday you revealed your divine nature by raising your friend Lazarus four days after he had died. Today you reveal your human nature by humbling and entering Jerusalem on a donkey's pole, accepting the praises of infants and of children. Bless all the faithful who celebrate this holy feast and purify their hearts and spirits, freeing them from jealousy, hypocrisy, hate, and doubt, and all that is sinful. May we be innocent like the children who praise you on this day, and may we conclude this feast with heavenly joy and receive the blessings of these branches. O Lord, save your people and bless your inheritance. Deliver us from the trials of temptation that we do not have the strength to overcome. Confirm us in the true faith and fill us with love for you and for each other. But ground us in the hope by your divine God, which you have shed for our salvation. By your grace and through the intercession of your holy and blessed Mother, guard and protect all Christians who celebrate this feast. Have mercy on all the faithful departed who have gone to their rest hoping in you, and may they dwell in your heavenly kingdom, rejoicing with you now and forever.
Next, you will find the sheets for the transfer hymn, which are special for this day. And because we didn't have the occasion to be able to practice it beforehand with the choir for obvious reasons, we will just recite it all together. Almighty Lord and God, you accepted the offerings of our ancestors. Now accept these offerings that your children have brought to you out of their love for you and for your holy name. Shower your spiritual blessings upon them, and in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. As we remember our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ and his plan of salvation for us, we recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day, especially Mary, the blessed mother of God, Saint Joseph, her spouse, the chosen one, Saint Mary, and Saint Jude, and Saint Charbel. Remember, O God, the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom this sacrifice is offered, for all the members of this parish, and for the intentions of the Catholic Extension Society and its donors. Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering. Continue with the anaphora of St. Mark the Evangelist on page 835. 835. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Lord God, Almighty Father, you are true in holy love. May we be bound by your divine love and find joy in it all the days of our lives. Make us worthy to give one another the greeting of peace with a holy kiss, that through Jesus Christ our Lord we may be your radiant and blameless flock. We all glorify and honor you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace to you, O holy altar of God. Peace. To the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O server of the Holy Spirit.
Let us give the greeting of peace with distance to our neighbor with love and faith that are pleasing to God. Lord God, we bow before you and ask that you grant us in your mercy the riches of your grace and kindness. May the compassion and assistance sustain us all the days of our lives through the grace of your only Son and his love for all people. We glorify and honor you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Holy God and Father, you sent your only Son to save us, for we are weak and poor. When we had gone astray, he brought us back to your spiritual fold by his royal blood, that through your grace and favor of your only Son, we implore you to accept this bloodless sacrifice, and from our sinful hands and through it to forgive all of our sins. We glorify and honor you, your only Son, Andrew, Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The love of God the Father and the grace of the only begotten Son and the communion and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your Spirit. Let us lift up our thoughts, our minds, and our hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord with reverence and worship him with humility. Right truly glory, truly glory, thanks, praise, and honor are yours, O God, the Father, maker of all creation. With your only begotten Son and your living Holy Spirit, the angels, archangels, and all the heavenly hosts bless and praise you. They cry out and they proclaim. Holy, holy, holy are you, God the Father Almighty, with your only Son and your Holy Spirit. When we had strayed from you by transgressing your law, you sent your only Son into the world for our salvation. By his saving passion he restored us to our original inheritance, and he gave us life by his divine blood. And Ono denita ho, fahro dielem. Dachlo faikun, wachlof sagie, metakase o meti hem. Hosoyon, hame wa hoyen on alam alamin. Alkoso dom sich women hamro women mayo Barajo kade Uyabel talmitao kado mara Sabishtao mehene kulhu O no denitao Demohun dilan diati kichdato Dachlo faikun wachlof sagie mete shadu meti hab. Chosunyon haume wa chaye dan alam alamin. Amen. 
whenever you observe these commandments, you proclaim my death and resurrection until I come again. Jesus Christ, we remember your plan of salvation for us, your conception, birth, and baptism, your saving passion, and your life-giving death, your burial, your glorious resurrection, and ascension into heaven, your sitting at the right hand of God the Father, and your royal second coming when you will judge all people and reward them according to their deeds. Now we ask you, at that fearful hour, have compassion on us and have mercy on us in your kindness and forgive our sins in your mercy. For this your church implores you and through you and with you implores your Father, saying, Have mercy on us, Almighty Father, have mercy on us. O oh Lord, as we, your sinful children, receive your graces, we thank you for them and because of them. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you, we profess our faith in you, we ask you, have compassion on us, O oh God, have mercy on us and hear us. May he perfect us. He may make this bread the body of Christ our God. Amen. And make the mixture in this chalice the blood of Christ our God. Amen. May these holy mysteries be for the forgiveness of sins, the pardon of faults, the honor of building and strengthening of your holy church, and the protection of her children from all sin. And may these holy mysteries allow us to stand with confidence before your awesome throne, that we may raise glory to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. O Lord, exalt your holy church established throughout the world. Protect your shepherds of the true faith in peace, and security all the days of their lives, especially Francis, the Pope of Rome, the Shara Peter, our Patriarch of Antioch, Gregory John, our Bishop, and all the bishops, pious priests, pure deacons, and all who serve your holy altar. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, all those who call upon your holy name, bless those who are near and bring back those who are far. Visit the sick and strengthen the weak, release captives and assist the oppressed. Bring back those who have strayed that they may live in your fear and reward those who have brought offerings to your holy church. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O Lord, our civil leaders and all the children of your holy church. Grant them security and peace, and keep domestic and foreign conflicts far from them, so that they may live in tranquility. Protect them by the sign of your living and victorious cross. Rescue the persecuted and the displaced of your flock, and be a refuge for strangers and a companion to travelers. Grant your eternal reward to monks, 
to those who live solitary lives, and to hermits who live on mountaintops and in caves of the earth. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, upon this altar and upon your heavenly altar, the holy and ever-Virgin Mary, Mother of God, the prophets, apostles, martyrs, confessors, and evangelists, John the Baptist, the forerunner Stephen, the archdeacon and martyr, Saint Joseph, Saint Marin, and all of the saints. May we join their ranks and share in their joyful feast. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord have mercy. Remember, O Lord, the faithful teachers who have gone to their rest in the true faith, especially Peter and Paul, Mark, Clement, Ignatius, Dionysius, Julius, and all those who endured suffering and persecution for the strengthening of your holy church. Remember also those who serve your holy altar and forgive their sins, that they may reach your joyful dwellings. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, all those who have left this world and have gone to you. Lead them to your joyful dwellings and blot out all their sins. Through our Lord God and Saviour Jesus Christ, who is without sin, we hope to find mercy and forgiveness for our sins and for theirs. Grant us pardon, O God, and forgive us and the departed, so that your blessed name may be glorified in us and in all things. With the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. O Lord, you are the pleasing oblation who offered yourself for us. You are the forgiving sacrifice who offered yourself for God. You are the high priest who offered yourself as a lamb. Through your mercy, may our prayer rise like incense, which we offer to your Father through you. To you be glory. O God the Father, you are merciful and compassionate. You have sanctified this divine service and have perfected it in your good pleasure by the grace of your only Son and by the descent of your Holy Spirit. Sanctify us now that we may be renewed as your spiritual children so that with pure hearts and enlightened souls we may call upon you, O glorious Father, and lover of all people, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. 
Deliver us, O Lord, from every temptation of soul and body, and crush our enemy, the evil one. Grant us your mercy through Christ Jesus, our Lord, for you are blessed and glorified with him and with your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with you. O oh Lord, look upon us, your inheritance who bow before you, and guide our steps on the right path. Make us worthy to share in this sacrifice, and may it sanctify the souls and bodies of those who receive it through Christ Jesus our Lord. We glorify and honor you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The grace of the Most Holy Trinity eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. Amen. Holy gifts for the holy, with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One, one Holy Father, Father, one Holy Son, one Holy Spirit. Blessed be the name of the Lord, for he is one in heaven and on earth. To him be glory forever. Make us worthy, O Lord. Again and again we thank you, O Lord, and raise glory to you for giving us your body to eat and your living blood to drink. O lover of all people, have mercy on us.
O God the Father, how can we who are unworthy thank you for your grace? For you have given us this divine gift and have made us worthy to share in the body and blood of your only begotten Son who saved us. Through him and with him, glory, honor are due to you, to your Holy Spirit, to you, to and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with you. And with your spirit. Jesus Christ, our Lord and God, you are worshipped and you are holy. Bless and forgive the priests who are the stewards of your people and of your holy church. Forgive the servers of your divine mysteries and all the faithful who have shared in this sacrifice. Care for orphans, help widows, assist the poor and the distressed, satisfy the hungry, and protect all who call upon your holy name in every place. May your name be glorified with that of your Father and your Holy Spirit, who is good, life-giving, and consubstantial with you now and forever. So, of course, we have to send greetings to our housebound who may be watching this later on on the internet. And may God protect you all. And also, it is delightful to have all of you here in our mini version of Parish. But mini is okay. It's still the divine mysteries. And may God, the hidden God of all mercy and consolation, watch over you, keep you safe. And may your steps be strengthened through the intercession of St. Rafka. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and the blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever. <laughs>